Well, thank you for coming. Uh, hope you guys enjoy Model View Presenter. Um, it's actually based from uh, Microsoft, is the first ones that actually came up with the MVP uh, pattern. Um, it's, been, been, it's been since adapted by Android and used in various different uh, apps. And they've actually just recently, thanks to Chuki who messaged me, uh, they have a on the Code Lab site a uh, testing module that actually talks about MVP uh, a little bit, and that's all about testing and other higher things, which I will cover a little bit. Um, but there is plenty of resources, and I have some links at the end that will help you deep dive. Um, I also will preface this that there's a lot of information, um, so I'm going to do a high level overview of them. Um, I also will be posting a YouTube series on, we'll be building an app through MVP so that you can go at your own pace so you don't have to feel like overwhelmed. So, hope you enjoy. Uh, my name is Michael Cameron, obviously, you see how we meet up, hopefully. If not, it's okay. Uh, I usually go by Cameron because there are usually a billion Michaels in the room. Uh, and my Twitter handle is Darkspow. If you feel like tweeting, it's fine. But. All right. Uh, so I was actually going to ask um, how many Android developers in there? Yeah. iOS developers? Kinda. Well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> back end web or? Uh, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so I will ask. What is that pattern? Model view, view controller. It's one guess. They disagree. MVVM. It is model view controller. <laughs> Yay, Joseph. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very, when you first look at MVC, you don't think that. Uh, but that's actually what usually happens when you go into MVC. Um, it's the pattern that I see most times. Uh, the reason this is is because MVC is modeled over behaviors. And so usually you have the controller trying to rule all the views and all the models. Now, uh, for iOS, it's a big, big key player. Um, they have the same rules like we usually do, where you don't have your model directly connected to your view. You're, you're not trying to write ugly code. We're all trying to make things that are separated, that make sense. Uh, we're just trying to do the right thing. How many, uh, this should be using this. <laughs> what are some pros and cons of using MVC? Well, like you said, code separation is a good thing. Code separation? But is that it assumes the controller should be controlling the model and the view, which isn't always applicable. Right. Lots of responsibility on the controller. But maybe he's doing too much. Uh, has anyone tried to unit test an MVC system? <laughs> Everybody laughs. That's great. Because it's, it's true. You're like, ah, hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, maybe in, in UI automation, you just have it covered there. Or emulator city. <laughs> so, uh, yes to all those. Uh, it was a good way to at least get away from having everything together. There's a lot of responsibility. It's not bad, but it's just a pattern. Um, patterns are neither good nor bad. They all have their pros and cons. And that pattern. It's MVP. I know. Uh, the difference here is I added, there's this extra row here for the view interface. Normally, those are implemented by both the view and the presenter, so you would hide them. But what that does is it allows you to actually hide the concrete implementations. <coughs> Pros and cons? Looks like there's more classes uh, that's a con. There is a lot more classes. In the uh, 
Google Guide for Android, they actually say, try to limit your abstractions if you can. I try to abstract as much as I think is needed and then unabstract as I performance test. I don't like to performance test too early. So if I need to reduce an abstraction to get some performance gain, I will. But otherwise, I'd rather to make sure things are more abstracted so it can be easier to read. Uh, we'll go into the details of each of these, but I want to kind of go through the flow a little bit. So the model is like your, we should all know what a model is. It's your base object. It's, uh, it could be a note. It could be a task. It could be a stock object. It could be your simple data set that you're wanting to use to either give to your view or transfer to a service to do a post request to the web. Your presenter is similar to the controller in an MVC setup. Except the presenter, uh, its job is to tell what the view and the model are supposed to do. But it doesn't control the implementation. Uh, it, only can, it only wants to know what's happening in the events. It wants to be aware of what's going on and tell people what to do. It's very similar to the mediator pattern where it's trying to coordinate what is going on and take charge, but not do so where it's aware of all the concrete implementations and having its finger in all the pies. It just wants to, okay, you, I know you're supposed to do this because my contract says so. By contract, I'm talking about the view interface. So the only way the presenter can tell the view what to do is through a contract, through an interface, saying, hey, I need you to go perform this op action on the view. You can do this, but only because I know we have a contract between us that you can do this. If you were to just go and tell the view to go do something, you could get uh, a method that's not uh, built. Like, let's say you're making your own view, and you forgot to implement some method because you're in a rush, and you need to do this, and you had a new view, and then someone runs a test suite, expecting this method to be there. It's not there. It crashes. Class death not found. Exception, you broke the build. Everyone's mad at you. Well, the, it, the contract is what keeps everyone in line. So, views. So I'm going to go to the top and explain some views. Views, in this case, I actually don't want you to get confused with the widget view. Don't think of it as I'm going to take the view, I'm going to put it in abstraction, and then I'm going to subclass that. No. <laughs> the view should be a view that you custom build that then either points to a layout file or points to your resource to, that explains your view. You shouldn't have to worry about it being the actual fundamental SDK view for whichever platform you're working on. Uh, I also said that this view is a tattletale, and by that, I mean, it is always telling the presenter through its contract what's going on. Ah, oh, someone clicked me. Oh, <laughs> something. There, any, everything, every action. I got scrolled. I got touched. I got this happening. Someone was entering this into a field. The view does not handle it in the view. It sends it to the presenter saying, hey, presenter, by the way, this happened. Hey, presenter, this happened. This gives the control to the presenter and not the view. It also gives you more control to see what is there, what's going on. So... With that, you can roll your views with an iron fist. You can tell it what to do because it's telling you everything that's going on. And then you should let the view tell you everything that happens. Any event that you do not tell is, a, is an event that could possibly be missed and not handled. View interfaces. So in this way, don't trust any class. Always have a contract. Think about your bank account, your mortgage, your anything you do, you have a contract that's binding that says this is what you're going to do, this is how it works. We should treat our classes with the same, same yardstick. We shouldn't just hope that these methods work out well. We shouldn't just hope that this method is implemented. We should have confidence to say, yeah, I'm going to call this and I know it's going to be called. So doing some polymorphism, making sure you have the contracts in place. When you say, when the presenter says, view dot update progress bar. Because it's in the contract to update progress bar, we know it'll get accomplished. How that's accomplished on the concrete end doesn't matter because the presenter is telling whoever is whoever's that view to handle it. 
but he's not doing it on his own. He's being told to do so. You must let the presenter know of any events. We've talked about that. The presenter. It's a big mediator, really. He tells the view and the model objects what to do. There's a big theme here. He's telling everyone what to do. I can tell I've said that a lot. Uh, one, one thing that doesn't seem very uh, intuitive is that it does handle events. So when it gets an event that says, I was tapped on a button, and maybe the button is load tasks. When that event is given to the presenter, the presenter knows this button was tapped, I need to get notes from a service. So then the presenter will go off to the service and say, hey service, go get me in my notes. It's not the view, it's the presenter getting, is telling and then delegating the task of getting the notes to the service. Again, the presenter is not doing the request. He's telling someone else to go do something. He's like, he's like your boss, he's always telling you to do stuff. Go do this, go do that. But he's always aware. What's going on? So I figured we could build our own app in MVP. Figured task it. So just, there's not enough task apps in <laughs> in the store right now, right? There's only a few. Uh, and we'll limit it to adding tasks, having a list of tasks, and looking at tasks in detail. Uh, if we were going to go do this, what do you think some uh, classes or things we should be making would be? Task. Yeah, we need a task model object. Good. Other class. Task list. No, you could have that. You could have a list. You could also have an array list of tasks, but yeah, we could have that too. Uh, how about the view? Who wants to take that one on? I never said what a view was yet. The risk takers? Should I have like rewards that I can? Like, you get a tablet, you get art. <laughs> I think a, uh, how about a task detail fragment? So, a fragment could be a view. It has a control of saying it loads with the layout. You could make activities also for views, but generally you want to break up the view, and that's what fragments are good for. Could have so let's see. How about uh, one of the contracts? <coughs> the task takers. interface. <laughs> Close. So you could have a interface for the view. So it could be task detail interface uh, dot view. So all the and then task detail interface uh, dot listener. So you could have two interfaces in one, and that's the trick for the event listener. I figured we wouldn't want to go through all of them. It would probably take too long. Uh, so we have add task fragment, task detail, fragment, task fragment. And if you notice, the, the contract is halfway in between both of them, because each one of those contracts have a dot view and a dot uh, listener interface in them. So each interface has two sub-interfaces in them. So the view is implemented in the fragment, or yeah, the, the dot, the interface <coughs> view is implemented in the fragment, the <coughs> listener is implemented on the presenter, and then each other one has a reference to them, so then it can, they can send the communication to each other. This bottom layer is really just for data services. It's a repository pattern. I'm not going to get into that. There will be a post on my YouTube on it, though. So don't worry about it. Not another pattern to worry about yet. Uh, but it's definitely where the presenter will offload to say, I need, need either a, give me all my lists, or my, my tasks, give me a specific task, or I want to add a new task. How are you guys feeling? You like it? Confused? Lost? Hate it? All right. Too early. We'll find out. Uh, so, I'm sure all of you guys are wondering, how do you test it? What goes up, how, is, how does testing work? Oh, 
First, I'm going to show you the contract that I was explaining first. I know we all don't like seeing code, but this might help alleviate what I was talking about for how the contract would look. So, interface view, show the indicator. This is what we agree on. So. Let's see a question for me. I noticed that all of the um, all of them are void, so there's no um, like data that's getting passed. It's just calling um, the different um, tasks within the, or the methods within the view or the listener. Yeah, in this case, there's no reason to like return an object because you're. But the idea is they're like, I'm just trying to tell you, like, hey, an event occurred, let you know. Um, <coughs> broadcast. Yeah, you can kind of do like a broadcast manager without setting it up. First one, I would say one show task and sending a bunch of tasks. So might be a communication as in, hey, give me a load of my tasks is what happens on the user page. You know, load tasks, get sent to the presenter, presenter goes to the repository, grabs all the tasks, gives it back to the presenter, says, here's your tasks, do what you want. Presenter says, cool, I'm gonna tell the view to show these tasks. So it's all interconnected and you see the whole flow. The best part is, you actually have, well, how do you test this? You have control over the whole pipeline once you are aware, once you're able to handle who, who, who passes what. So if I already have someone that says, I'm always just gonna pass you a list of objects. I'm always gonna send you this event. I'm always this object. Means you can then swap them via inversion of control. How many people are familiar with dependency injection? It's a good number. Uh, well, thankfully, you really don't need to know about it uh, to get this under the. Uh, I know, I can go right into dagger and go crazy, but that's for another day, too. We need to get understanding what inversion of control is and why it's so helpful. So, really, all it is is being able to inject or pass your object to define what you're wanting to set. So in the presenter, we could pass what kind of repository or what kind of service. We could have a <coughs> fake service that always returns one, or a, a, a static ta task that we've built. So we know that every time I talk to this repository, it's only gonna be this exact one task. So I can prove and assert that it's always this task. Or I can build my own fr uh, test fragment that always sends this communication. So when I run up, run the test, I want to ensure that as the loads, I load this, I inject this fake view, that I should get this communication broadcast sent to the presenter. So you're testing the flow one by one as you inject each expected type. And that's really all inversion of control is. It's just being able to pull out your dependencies from being, uh, and we've all done it where you have your class and you say, object equals new object right inside the object and you're like cool now I'm concrete tightly coupled to this thing I hope it doesn't hurt me later so this way you can just say you know what let someone else tell me what object I need to hear so in this case here's like the add task presenter it's got the task repository the even the contract is passed in and this image file because should, our task should have an image, why not? And the dishes that I need to do, to get a picture of them. <laughs> uh, so in this case, we're passing it in, uh, and we're setting the repository. Uh, a really cool part of Android Studio, so sorry iOS and web developers, you do not get this. Uh, you can actually set different build variants to inject the different types of mocks. So if you're not comfortable with Dagger and you still want to get into learning how to just understand what it's doing under the covers, understanding how to mock things, how to get things injected properly, you can learn how to do these, this mocking with build variants and you can just say, I want to run this in mocked mode. So maybe your production app, it connects to Google Play services, it maybe hooks up to your crash analytics stuff, it maybe students some QA reporting or analytics strategies tracking and you really you just want it to run through your automation tool and not do any of that you can change the variant and say just inject these things and test this 
don't inject Google Play, don't do any of this stuff. Just do this so I can test that the core app is working in these variances. So it's nothing special on the injection. The prod debug build variant repositories get the new task service implementation. Mock debug version, fake task service implementation. So there's no fancy magic that goes in and swaps the data layers or anything you have to worry about going through bytecode and try to hope that everything's working right. It's, it just loads the associated file based on the build variant. So uh, the way Android Studio works with the build variants is you, when you change it, it actually tries to look in the directories. And if you have the same class name, so this is inject.java on both of these. On mock debug, it'll load that one. And on regular prod debug, it'll load that one. Just changing which file is loaded. Regular unit testing. So this is not Expresso testing. This is where you run it on the JVM. You don't have to load it to your Android device. You're just wanting to test a simple test case. Uh, there's a really, really useful system called Mockado where you can at, add the at mock annotation and then be able to say, on the associated mocked object, which I didn't add here, but I should have, um, to say that this mock is associated with this result. So when it says at mock task repository, and then mockato animation init mocks, goes and grabs the associated mock. This one might seem a little like more magic, but it's actually just capturing when you say, this, this guy's responsible for mocking, or this is my mocked object, this is the guy who wants mocks. And it just associates the classes. And it's okay if you don't get this yet. It's, it's a start. Um, but it is possible, and that's the best part, is that we can start testing. So I think just beginning is helpful. Screen. You point at your computer. Ah, thank you. <laughs> and the technology on this thing. Espresso. So, Espresso is really cool in that you don't have to worry about uh, segregating your, your, just loading up some file and then worrying about the activity not loading to call this method. Here you can actually just run the app and have an automation tool go over and check what you needed to check and say, yep, my text is where I need it to be. It's, everything's working out. Uh, it's not worrying about backend data. It's not a business logic to check. It's a UI check. So maybe we want to test that, uh, in this case, that the note details is displayed when the, when the detail activity starts up. So in this case, we're, the screen is the detail screen for the task. We have a static task where the title is task is descriptions of rocks. We have an image. Uh, we set which activity we want to roll, use to test with. In this case, it's the task detail activity. Uh, make it what we're going to launch with at test, and it's super simple. Uh, there's also a really cool, uh, really helpful cheat uh, cheat sheet on how to set up your tests on what you need to test. Uh, like here you can say on view with ID, and you can get your detailed title, description, image, and check that it matches either this, the task title from the task object. So here you're checking that the object's title matches what's displayed in the UI. You can go more granular, when you get into IOE resources, but. I wanted to show that as neat. And that's all I have for MVP. Uh, so there's the code labs, and then there's the MVP on 
or convict nucleus. Uh, some people go very, very far into the MVP. The first link there, actually, he has it where he actually makes the fragments life cycle methods given to the presenter as well. Uh, use that as your own guide, um, but it's up to you. But he's using the idea that all the events that occur, I'm passing to the presenter, so he's going full force there. Uh, in my example, I do not use do not pass the life cycle methods to the presenter in my task series that I will show on YouTube very soon. Questions? Can I look at the unit test part again? Sure, which one? Uh, the slide on the, the mosquito, yeah, that one. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering um, what part of it that makes it specific to MVP versus like so, other Right, things? okay. So, the, the part that makes this close to MVP is that we can put this test in the, we can do it in the presenter, we can put it in the view, and we can, we can do that anywhere, and by mocking it, we can mock either the presenter or the view at any time, or, and stub any other, other dependencies, and be able to, since we have control of the full plumbing, uh, we can say, I have a controlled environment of this presenter is doing this, and this event's gonna occur because I tell to event, I'm mocking the view, so I assert that this should happen. So you're just ensuring that all of the pipeline is under control. So in the MVC way, events occur, you're hoping to catch everything that occurs, the behaviors, and there's one guy who's trying to control everything, but, he's, but he can't. Uh, in this one, I have full control over the entire pipeline. The presenter, I expect the view's gonna give me this because I have a mock telling me that it's gonna do that. I need to make sure that my presenter is handling correct. I have this business logic rule that when I get this event, this should occur. I can have a unit test that tests that exact flow. I just put in a mock for that exact uh, mock that says view, mock view that sends specific broadcast. Mock that, run the test, ensure that that mocked view sends the broadcast, you test the presenter, does what it should do when it gets that receipt. So you're controlling, you can control the whole aspect of the life cycle. So in this particular case, you are mocking the view interface uh, yes. part, and are sure. you also mocking the model as well? I'm mocking the repository. Which yes. has got one layer below the, yes. the model. Because okay. the test here, uh, is like get task callback. So if I mock my whole repository and say give me a task, I don't have to like look up in a database what the exact task is. And I'm then you just use I, the real model. You don't mock the model. I don't mock the model. Okay. Here it's just like I want to. I'm testing that the presenter can talk to the repository, give me back a note or not a note, a task. And when I get that back, what should I do? So give it back to the view. So here the test would be. Make sure you get this one task that I know is going to be a special task or my task rocks uh, task. And ensure that that one is given back to the view. I don't care how the repository got me that task because that's not what I'm testing. That should be that should be mocked. That should just give me the task the task I expect it to be. And then the presenter's job is okay. Do you give it to the view? No. And then you don't really care if the view got it, but you do you do need to ver verify that the presenter sends it to the view. There's even a Makoto command, uh, test that says verify method was called for view. So you don't care, you don't, the view doesn't have to do anything other than Makoto track says, yep, got this task, you sent it to this view, good job. Clear as mud? <laughs> can presenters talk to other presenters? Uh, they can, but it's limited. Like, hey presenter, I'm about to die because they're switching activities. Um, go start your intent. Launch intent. And then done. So it's, again, it's just sending a, bro uh, a broadcast across. <clears throat> Uh, and 
And, and so there should only be one live presenter at any given point in time? No. Oh, okay. uh, so presenter per fragment. <clears throat> right. So there's a there's a correlation that for every presenter there should be an associated view. So if you have two fragments stacked on top of each other, there could be two presenters there. If it's a master detail view or anything like that. But if it takes up the whole view, there's just one. And that's where the benefit of MVP helps is that you can you're ensure that there's a one-to-one -one ratio that you're, you're accounting for. Where on the first example, you could have MVC with multiple models talking to one controller or talking to multiple views or generating new views. Uh, it is easy to abuse this pattern, especially if you start your learning how this works. Uh, I went through a lot of tutorials trying to figure out what is the right way to do MVP. And I, there's one on code project, there's one, there's plenty on GitHub, uh, there's the Google one. And I trust the Google one. And you should always, always use your best judgment. If you're not getting what you need out of it, you should ask yourself why. If it's, if it's getting really hard, maybe you should stop and think about it. Like, what's going on? Why is this harder than I expect it to be? So why do you want to use MVP? Like, what are you trying to get out of it? What am I trying to get out of it? <laughs> control. <laughs> control. Always control. Uh, we, I don't like seeing side effects occur. And one of the, the big things in the Clean Code series from uh, Uncle Bob is about always having control over what's occurring. So as soon as you don't have, you make a method and a side effect occurs, you've lost control in your code base and you don't know what else could be happening. You could have unintended regression, you could be trying to get a release out and then find out that you can't because QA found this bug that's caused by some view that's doing something and you need to go track that, oh, someone else is hooking up this other focus change listener and now the whole view is going crazy. So you like the contract part? Basically. I do like the contract part. It's my favorite part. I'm an interface fan. It took me a while to get interfaces and see their value, but once I understand it, it's like, oh, you, you will listen to me if I give you a contract. It's probably easier to test because the presenters are smaller. Yes. More decouple from each other. Yes, decouple when you can. But keep the rule that one presenter per view. Maybe ask yourself, is your view doing too much? Any other questions? So I have a very complicated question. Okay. <laughs> um, because I was trying to figure out, for example, if I have a form that I want to do validation on. Yes. Like, how would you break that out into an MVP way? Because there's a lot of interaction going on there. So I validate this form, which is logic, but then I have to tell back and say, oh, now display a little icon that says this field is required. Right. right? Well, how would that kind of handshake work? So you're probably wondering, okay, how do I differentiate between I, I'm using a login, password, or anything, wrong username, incorrect, whatever. Right. So uh, I found this also was in the Google uh, the Code Labs. Um, you do not need to do an MVP per form edit text. Uh, it's one view. What you should do is you take that result that's being sent there, send it to your presenter. <laughs> Your presenter does not handle it, it, hand, it sends it to a form validator. The form valid, validator should take that string, or whatever you're using to validate, and have a rules engine to validate what, and run through the rules through the strategy pattern, which is a way to just load each way. Uh, and it is complicated to explain. But this is per uh, edit text you're talking about at right. this moment, so, not the whole form. But right, but yeah. when you but when you enter it, mm -hmm. if you have say an event that occurs like on change listener, that event it, events should always be passed to the presenter because it's a tattletale. Mm -hmm. So if it gets passed to the presenter, the presenter gets this notification: Hey, someone entered this text with a password change. Hey, uh, password validator, go validate. Right. And then it'll either return a boolean or a custom message response, and then the presenter, based on that, will tell the view what to do. Okay. So maybe like if it passed, then tell the viewers, like, okay. change the icon to smiley face, exactly. and then if it, it got the message from the other dude that says, no, that's a bad password, then it tells the view that's like... Give it the red X, the big right. explanation mark, okay. the lines. Yeah. 
So in this way, the presenter isn't taking control of validating. It's still sending them off to say, whoever's responsible for validating this, go validate it. Let me know when you come back. Uh, and so when, it, when it's doing that, it could have an indicator of progress or something to tell the view, hey, while I'm getting this, just hold on a minute. Goes, comes back to the presenter. The presenter's like, cool, thanks. Here you go, view. And pass it back to the view. I definitely encourage you to look at the mediator pattern. It's very similar to this. Um, it's just the mediator tries to talk to everybody all the time. This was a more focused version of the mediator pattern. Do you ever get artifacts of where presenters are telling you to do things that don't logically make sense and then you have to? Uh, there's some that you need to see if a event should be discarded. So it could be you're entering like a search and you have a result showing up. So you go search, search, type, 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 and then like, ah, never mind. And you hit X. You could have that that first text that you were sending went through goes through some web service. The web service is doing a call. The web service is trying to come back. But by that time, the presenter gets told, nah, never mind. I'm done. Like, I really don't want that. You have this result. Now, you could have a bug come back and say, well, I got your result. Do you want it? The, the presenter needs to have a, you should then build in a logical priority. What events have what priority? Is a dismiss event an event that says, all right, this blocks all the other events? Well, what if the presenter didn't even exist anymore? Well, if it didn't Because let's say the web service was somewhat delayed, the user changes to another so it, view or activity, and the corresponding presenter doesn't even exist now. So if the presenter goes away, the view should be gone. And if the view is gone, that means that the fragments destroy call would have been called. Um, granted, we, we have seen where things are called on data fragments before. Well, not really dead, they're detached. Yeah, see you guys nodding. Um, the answer then is, do you care about the response? And is the one handling the response in the correct location? So like the presenter being not attached to the life cycle can then determine, is my view alive? So it can do a check before it even, part of the contract. Before I even send it, does it say, are you alive? No, I should not send you anything. And then it should then get cleaned up by the garbage collector because there should be no one pointing to it. Other than the web service that was waiting for it to return. Which, if you get a notification that it dies, you should then tell the web service to cancel and then have a dangling pointer and it gets cleaned up. So it's very important to manage all those little tiny things that don't show up in nice little presentations. <laughs> Does this help cut down on the need for espresso and unit testing because you can now swap out views with more code as opposed to testing? I'd rather say it promotes testing in that you now are you have more comfort you're, you should be more comfortable being able to say, you know, I can test my view in this form I don't have to worry about other side effects. I don't feel like I need to start up the activity, then go through all this process, and then now I'm here, now I'm gonna run the test. You should be able to say, I just wanna load my activity hardest and load my view, load my presenters, and test this case. You guys love it, right? It's great. <laughs> So in the less simple version, <clears throat> the various presenters would be also hooked into other things like your uh, password validation um, and that kind of thing. Right. They should be able to know who who they should care about during that sy system's life cycle. Like, I'm at a login page, so I should probably be aware of this validation service. But also you have to be aware of what they shouldn't be aware of. Like, if I'm in, if I'm adding a new task, I shouldn't really care about loading all the tasks. That's not, it's not his job. But I guess that would be kind of like the data services layer that the presenter yeah. would go to. Right, and, then, and in this case, he only talks to this repository that's like one place that says, hey, you know how to handle this? Go get me this. And not have to worry about details. The less classes you have to know about other classes, the better. And then the task repository would be an interface Yes. So you can swap that out too. Yes. You can go hog wild on interfaces. <laughs> Any other 
questions or comments or? What would you say some of your biggest obstacles were to adopting this framework? Uh, understanding it first, uh, for sure. Like understanding, because I always wanted to make the widget view of you, and every time I saw oh MVP MVP, the view 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 view, and I'm like, well, how in the world am I going to control all the events on this widget dot view? Like I don't get how I'm supposed to control that because I don't have access to that. That's an SDK thing. How am I supposed to mock? Like, I, I was going crazy. Like, I didn't understand why uh, that, that was not working at all. Until I, I came, like, aha, I am whatever, I make a view of my own, and then I just reference whatever thing's going to load the layout that the user sees. I'm still technically loading the layout. The layout is just a resource. It's not really a view. If you try to take it like that, then you're just swapping in that. that. And their view is really the guy that controls how things are displayed on, the, on there concretely. So that was like my biggest, like when I had that aha moment, it means, oh, now I can have full control of the view. Because I can understand the presenter. It's very similar to the interface. Like, all right, I have a mediator pattern. I got that guy. That's easy. Uh, the, the dual interface was a new one for me. I'm used to just having, okay, here's an interface, and here's an interface, and here's an interface. And then maybe I'll make one interface that's common to all of them that includes those ones or try to do some verbs types of interfaces. But having one that says, here's a contract, Here's the contract for the view, and here's the contract for the presenter. And that was a new step for me as well. Uh, but now that I understand the flow, it makes more sense, because it's, it's a relationship. But it's a contract relationship, and not a tightly coupled relationship. Joy, oh. <laughs> booze. <laughs> it's another analogy that presenters are like a whole bunch of mini controllers. Yeah. Cause, yeah, they felt like very small, very have like specific jobs, which was I think the point of MVC in the first place was like you have one job, you're gonna control this, and you're gonna go through and what always happened is because they were like, oh, I've got this MVC, and I got this MVC, and then they become a, a view controller that does way too much in the end. They take over all the jobs, they end up taking all the stuff, they're like, ah, oh, we don't need a data service, I'll just do it in the view controller. And this view controller talked to that view controller, and it just got really big. Um, I bet if we were all really, really good at controlling our view controllers, we'd probably be like, hey, this is an MVC meeting. Uh, but it's really easy to abuse things that don't have set boundaries, and I think that's probably what made it Are your contracts commonly restful? Like synchronous, or are you talking about like? Like when you're, since you've got a bi directional contract, do they have typical CRUD operations? Uh, it depends on what you're expecting. Um, like if you're on a view, the contract for the view is like, oh, you have an edit text, so I probably should be able to set your text. Uh, you should probably tell me your text, so that's an event. Uh, it's, it's really debated, it's really based on what uh, implementations are on your view. So if it's a view with the various widget objects, and those all have events, you need to make sure those are captured in the events. And if there's anything you want to control from outside that view, that's what you should try to I have a question. Uh, task detail presenter looks like it uses a task. It's kind of a dependency arrow. Yes. Which makes sense. Yep. But I also see a task pointing to the task detail presenter as if the task knows about the presenter. So it's actually a flow where the task detail presenter goes to the repository, probably gives back a task, the task deals with the presenter. So. Okay. So. Sorry. There's a lot of arrows there. Yeah, the confusing <laughs> one is the arrow to the right of the one going from task to task detail presenter. See, there's one going this straight one? down. No, go or further right this one? from uh, go <laughs> right. <laughs> Too many task arrows. Box. The task box. See the one oh, incoming? So no, on the right. right. <laughs> on the right. <laughs> on the right. Up, uh, up, straight up. up, 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 up some more. Oh, this one? To the right. There yeah. That one. 
So the task detail presenter would then be able to modify the task. Yes, the presenters can modify model objects. And, and so any update in the view that needs to get propagated down to the task, like change the title of it or update the time, would get pushed down into the task. And so the presenter has control over it. So the arrows don't really show dependencies, they show a flow. Yeah, it's, a, it's more of a flow diagram. Do you usually try to make your models like pure Java and no Android stuff so you can unit test them, or it doesn't matter? Do. You do. I do not like to mix my SDKs <laughs> and my Pojos. <laughs> <laughs> and it's usually like easy to do that, or sometimes you're like, I wish I can put a bundle in, but I'm going to stay away from it. <laughs> uh, we've had cases where we needed to test the parsable. Right. Um, so I think parsable is the only thing that we've definitely kept in. But most of the time, you can just use Pojo for Yeah, most of the time. That's um, good. Yeah, because usually you're not testing the unmarshalling and marshalling, so then you can get away with it. And then on the instrumentation test, you can then test parsable or other Android things as, as you want. Um, so when you get into the unit testing, there's like an instrumentation test that actually loads the whole SDK, and you can call all of them to your heart's content. But if you ever do the JVM, the SDK is empty. There's They all just return. Nothing actually, the implementation's all locked. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you guys asked a lot of good questions and seemed to be interested. So. Wow. Oh, and the light turns off at eight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.